All right, so uh, let me introduce, introduce myself. My name is Maciej Voiden. I'm a senior software engineer in Bloomberg. I work for the real-time data feeds team. Um, so Bloomberg, again, is a foremost a technology company selling financial data and, analyti and analytics. It's also a media news company with offices around the world. So let's go over the talk. So first what we're going to do, I'm going to show you what is esoteric data. I'm going to show you how data is entrapped in bad formats, encodings, or APIs. We'll quickly cover why it's important. Then I'll show you how to use Pandas to elegantly compare your data. And then I'll show you how to free your data. So we'll use PyArrow to free our data. Then I'll show you why you want to use PyArrow and Apache Arrow. And then at the end, we'll quickly go over how to use the Apache Arrow API, Clang, and Jinja to free C++ APIs. And I'll show you what that actually means. So first, let's see what is esoteric data. So here is an example of a fixed protocol message. Again, it's very common in the financial industry. It's ASCII encoded with tag value pairs, right? Um, and it covers financial data, all sorts of data. Um, another example is this is a CSV file. So again, notice we have a row with the column names separated by the delimiter, which is a comma in this case, and the preceding columns with the values. Again, another view of the same data. So this is the JSON view. So essentially, each, each row is a Python dictionary with key values for each column. And finally, here is an example of a binary encoded message. So this is a ARCA data feed trade. And typically, you would read these messages by creating a class where each field in the class corresponds directly to an offset in the packet. And that's how you would read it. And you would actually read the raw bits directly from the buffer. Right, so here's an example. And then finally, here is a essentially proprietary class where the only way to access the data is through the public interface, through the getters of the class, right? Sometimes it's nested. A lot of legacy systems, you just kind of see this code, right? Companies have been for, uh, around for a long time. They have a lot of old C++ or C code, and that's the only way you could actually access it. And the way to actually serialize, deserialize, it's, it's you, don't, you don't know, you don't care, you don't want to know, right? So, to sum up, esoteric data is data that is inconsistently structured, has no schema, no human readable output, has inconsistent API interfaces, and it's hard to analyze. Why is it important? It's because that's how companies make money, right? So, so you're, you're kind of stuck with it, right? So you have to work with this data, diff against old data, check changes, upgrade precision, add new logic. So you can't change the data, but you could change the way you analyze the data, the way you compare the data, the way you visualize the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some demos using some uh, data from the IMF website. This is what it looks like. Again, um, you know, some, some, some data which I found. It, it, it's going to illustrate pretty well. So one of the first things you're going to have to do with this kind of data is, again, you're, you know, we have a system that generates some data. You make, a, uh, you make a change, you're going to have to diff against old, old data, right? So one way to do it is if it's in some sort of ASCII format, you could just call the diff command. It'll give you the nice quick diff of all the rows that have difference. The only problem is you can't really tell where the difference is. You know, there's a difference here, there's a difference here. The rest is kind of hard. It's kind of, kind of hard which columns have the difference. It's, it's hard to figure out how many of the columns have a difference, right? Um, and again, this is kind of the, where I'm going to focus on is kind of the difference, right? Because again, you're, all, you're making a change to some old legacy system. You want to make sure that you, you, know, you, could, you could figure out if the difference is true, whether it's good enough, if it's not good enough, and you will want some tools to do that, right? So this is kind of the first tool you're going to use. And it, you know, it'll work for some, some data sets. It won't work for some others. So again, another thing you can do is you could create a kind of an awk command line. You know, here, you, you could kind of you know, write the little snippet that's going to actually look at the specific columns and tell you if they matched or not. You know, it works too, not as flexible. But I mean, as Python programmers, we know we could do better, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use Pandas for doing this kind of uh, operation. So again, Pandas is a data and analytics framework in Python. Most of you are probably familiar with it. If not, I'm going to show some examples. So let's start. Um, so again, so our standard imports. We're going to load two data sets, one from the IMF website, and one that I've, just, I've modified slightly. So this way, just to, to simulate some differences, right? 
Again, here's the data. So this is a pandas data frame. We got columns. We got the row numbers. So first thing, instead of doing a diff, what I'm going to do is create a compare function, right? So very quickly, what we could see is uh, a top-level view of all of our differences, kind of percentage-wise, right? We could see how many percent, like 99%, 90, you know, very, it's very close. So quickly see where our differences are on a column-wise matter. We could also see very quickly which columns had differences, which ones didn't. And we could also, for every single numeric type, we could find the max difference in that column. Right? So maybe, you know, maybe some differences are acceptable. You know, it's bound maybe by a threshold. Then you can make that decision, hey, this is, oh, this is good enough, this is not good enough. But again, you have the power to kind of, uh, kind of change the way you do and analyze the difference using pandas. Right? So that, that example only works for data that's aligned. Right? So what that means is both, both sides have to have the same row numbers and they have to have the same size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how if your data is not aligned, how to align it, and then do the comparison. So again, for the alignment, what you want to do is find some columns that uniquely identify a row. For a time series, it would be the date, so something that uniquely identifies the row. Right? So here's I'm going to show you some pandas magic. Um, so one way of doing it is you use a pandas merge with an outer join. We, we, we make sure it's unique, and also we actually, we're not going to do a join on all of the data. All right? We're just going to make sure we join on the data we care about, and make sure we save our row number into the data frame. Again, some more pandas magic. So here, what we want to do is we want to, we want to get three data sets from our alignment. So we want to get the data that was aligned, the data that's missing, and new data. All right? So here we have our aligned data, left only. So again, this is data that's missing that was in the previous data set, but not in our new data set. Right only, it's the converse, right? Uh, is where we have the data in our new data set, not in our old data set. And then here we actually do the comparison on our aligned data, right? And then we do some more things here. So what that actually gives us, a nice summary, hey, this is my missing data, this is my new data, right? And it's not, it's not like a diff, it's like this is, you know, we could have some more kind of um, some idea about like, you know, this is not a diff, but it's actually new data that we introduced, which we have to reconcile, right? And then finally what we could do is, we could also look at the diff, but look at it in a slightly more friendly fashion. So what, one thing we could do is provide context, right? So we could actually give specific columns we want to look at and the diff side by side. So we don't, the columns that did match, we don't care about, but you could also change this very easily, right? To whatever, whatever is suitable for the problem. So then you have a nice, nice summary, quickly look at the difference. You could spot trends um, and things like that. So now what if your data can't be aligned, right? What if there's no columns, it's too big, it, it just won't, won't ever work. So even if you do try it just it either takes too long or, or something of that sort. So what you could do is you could, you could look at frequency analysis, right? So what you do is this code right here, essentially what it is, it creates a series of rows where every row is every single value inside your data frame, right? And so what this means is it's like minus three right here, um, the column amount has one single value of minus three. Venezuela has 37 values in the member column. But the nice thing is you get a single column, you get a single data frame, with all the columns and all the values inside your data frames. And then what you would actually do is, you would subtract one from the other. The nice thing about this is, if we use the fill value equals to zero with this uh, panda sub function, it will actually make sure, even if you have extra values, it'll actually fill in zeros for, for us, and then it'll, it'll, it'll still work, right? And then, then what we get is a nice summary of all the possible differences. So this value, there was a difference in the amount column, right? And here, again, we have these dates were different in, you know, the transaction value, the original arrangement date. So what you get is a nice top-level overview, statistical overview of your difference, right? And the nice thing is you could spot trends very easily, right? If, for example, you introduce a new date, and that's the only difference you see, it might be still okay, right? So, and then again, you get a nice overview of all the differences, right? So again, a much better way of doing a diff for your data, right? So, so let me show you how to free your data, how, how to make sure we can read any old data from whatever kind of format you have, the fastest way you could do it, and have pandas be able to read it. So what I'm going to show you is how to use Apache Arrow. So Apache Arrow is a development platform for in-memory analytics and contains a set of technologies that enable big data system to process and move data fast. 
It specifies a standardized language independent columnar memory format for flat and hierarchical data, organized for efficient analytics um, um, operations on modern hardware. Okay, so that's the definition. You could check it out there. I'll show you examples exactly what that means and why you want to use it. Okay, uh, PyArrow are the Python bindings for Apache Arrow in, in Python. And Parquet is a um, data format closely tied to Apache Arrow. Um, I'm not going to go deep too into it. You could check it out, but I'll show you examples of why you want to use it. Okay, so, so let me start with an example uh, for, for this, right? So again, we are standard imports. Um, and again, so this is essentially how you would read a CSV file. So I just provided all the possible um, options you could use. So one thing is, uh, you know, a Apache Arrow stores its data in a table. So we have the PyArrow table. One thing to notice, it, it is strongly typed. So just like a data frame. So every, every you know, column has a type, a name. You have, uh, you know, rows and columns. So again, if your data, for example, looks like a CSV file, but it's not a, not a CSV file, what if the delimiter is different? You could always, there's a lot of flexibility in the way you actually read the data. So you can you know, change the delimiter, change other things to make sure, you know, you can read it by Apache Arrow. So, so, you know, this will still work in Pandas, and I'll show you why you want to actually use Apache Arrow instead of Pandas. So let me show you why you want to use Apache Arrow. So again, Apache Arrow, very similar interface to Pandas. So again, we have our good old Pandas read CSV. It takes about 23 milli milliseconds. And then using the Apache Arrow version, it goes down to about 8 milliseconds. All right? So we didn't actually do anything except we changed this, this right here, the PA.CSV. So one thing we also do here is we do two operations. First, we load the CSV into a Apache Arrow table, and then we convert it to pandas. So one thing to notice is that we use the strings to cats and the use threads. So the read and then the conversion into pandas is actually multi-threaded. And we also make, tell Apache Arrow, hey, please convert all, all our strings to categories automatically. And I'll show you what that actually means. All right, so even if our data was in Parquet, It'd be even faster. As you can see, it's slightly faster, right? So that's why, again, you want to save your data in Parquet because even the, re the, the that's by far the fastest way you could read a, uh, any data into a pandas data frame. And so, so the read again, it's not magic. If you actually look at the CPU time, it's about closely, it's about 18 millis compared to 23, right? Because it is actually multi-threaded when it does the read, right? So again, we have our JSON example. So here it was 140. Four, it goes down to about 15 milliseconds. So here we have tremendous speed up. So if your data looks like a JSON, you definitely want to use this function. All right. So I mentioned, uh, you know, it converts strings to cats. So again, categories, it's a, a pandas concept. What it means is columns are not stored as strings, but they're essentially encoded with a dictionary where you have an index inside into the dictionary inside your column, right? So here's kind of the, the version with just strings. It takes about 10 megabytes in memory. Then here is the version from Batchera where we converted all cats or, or strings to cats, one meg in memory, right? So we reduced it about nine times just by including that flag. So we have the same thing for our CSV version, our JSON version. Now, why do, why do cats matter? There's, you know, you do have the memory reduction, uh, but also on the speed side. So again, do, running our compare function, it takes about 31 millis with strings, and about 16 millis with using cats. So again, we reduced our processing time by half just by switching all of our co uh, columns to categories. Uh, so, so one thing is, you, you, know, you could always take, if you know the columns up front, up front you could you know, tell pandas, hey, load these as cats. You could always do this where you take every object, convert it, as, convert it to a category. But again, it's expensive, right? It's about 15 millis, and it's a hassle, right? And who needs that? So another example I'm going to give you, so we, you know, we, we covered the JSON, the CSV. Those are pretty kind of standard way to, ways to store data. So let's do something where we have a crazy regex to parse our data, right? So this is just a, just a standard CSV parser. So this actually parses a CSV file. So what we would do is we would create your, your kind of your, your parser, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter, right? What I'm trying to show is, so what you want to do is you want to take your weird data, which you have to parse, with some you know, crazy logic, and you want to actually save it to something better. So you know, we could CSV, but we're actually going to save it to Parquet. Right, so here's, here's the code. This is pretty straightforward. 
uh, we run the, the, the parser. And so, you know, then what you do is essentially have our column names. Our data is a list of lists with each nested list is just the values for the columns. And again, you know, we could store it inside a data frame. It takes 21 millis. But what we could do is we could actually convert it, store it inside of P Apache Arrow, right? So here, this is what we do. The, to a, the way to store it, you actually create a Apache Arrow array with your Python list of Python objects, and you call from arrays, and that creates a table. So again, we do the both operations, convert to a table, then to a pandas data frame. It's slightly faster. Um, again, we, we do get the cats, the cat conversion automatically. Um, so one thing is, if we didn't actually convert to pandas from Apache Arrow, we get about eight millis, right? So actually the, the conversion into Apache Arrow table is very fast. It's much, much faster. It's about, you know, it's almost three times faster if you just want to store it in the Apache Arrow table. And again, we get the, the cats for free using Apache Arrow. And one thing why we want to just first store it inside Apache Arrow table, let's say using that regex, right? So again, using pandas, converting to Parquet, even though, even though underneath this still uses the Apache Arrow engine, um, you know, just writing the Parquet file using our table, you know, about three times uh, speed improvement. And the reason you want to use uh, Parquet is it just takes less space on disk, right? It's about two megs, goes about to a quarter meg. Again, we don't, you don't lose any data because Parquet is encoded. So it encodes all your strings. That's where, you know, that's where you get this huge uh, memory reduction. Um, you know, it's a win. Might as well use it, right? So one more other interesting portion of Apache Arrow is it supports hierarchical data. So what that means is, so here's a simple example, right, where we have two rows, city and population, it's double nested, right? So we have populations nested, then population is nested again. We would read it into our Apache Arrow table. Here's our schema. So, you know, Apache Arrow picks up the, the schema and generates, um, uh, generates the schema in, and, and the data. And Apache Arrow provides a very convenient flatten function. So what that means, it'll actually flatten your nested structure. So you flatten once, you get this. Flatten twice, you actually get your, all your data structures flattened. So it's very convenient if you have, you know, nested structures um, and you want to just analyze them and just want to flatten it and then run through your compare, your alignment function, your, your frequency, any, anything you really want to do in Pandas now, it works. Because again, Pandas doesn't work with hierarchical data. This, essentially what it is, it's a Python object, so like a dictionary stored as um, as a column, so that's not going to be too helpful. But with this, you can actually run, run things on it, right? So now, so I went through kind of the Pi Arrow version of it. Now, what if your data is only C++, right? So, um, so, so now the data is in C++ in a way where you can't really, you could maybe see out it or something like that, but it's still, it's, it's still not good enough. What if you have a lot of this data, right? So it's kind of clunky to, to access, clunky to use. So what I'm going to show you is how to use Python to create a converter to Parquet. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Python to parse our code using the C index module. So that's part of Clang. Uh, then we're going to generate a schema. And then we're going to use a Jinja template to actually create the converter. And then we're going to convert. All right? So here's our sample data. So this is a nested class we're going to have. So again, note it has two getters. So again, we're going to focus only on the public interface because that's for example, if you don't have the source code to the original class, this is the only way you could access the data. That's why it becomes harder, right? Because now you don't know what this is. You don't know the types that, that it has. It'd be nice if, if something was able to kind of extract this information. There's no schema associated with this data. And our two messages, right? So we have message A, message B. Again, um, message B, the thing is it has the, the price that's nested class within it, right? So, so we kind of have to figure out, hey, th there's, there's another class here with other kind of columns. So in reality, what we want to do is we want to say, hey, get low, get high, treat that as a com column in our final data set. Again, get A and B, get prices, get price. Everything wants to be essentially a column. Each class is essentially a data frame um, that we want to uh, then do our other analysis on. So let me show you how to actually create the schema. All right, so here we start with our standard imports. And here we actually compile the code, all right? 
So here what we get, we compile messages.h, and what we get, we get the abstract, abstract syntax tree of the C++ code, right? The nice thing about it is it's very easy to parse in Python because it is a Python object. And I'm gonna introduce a, single, uh, a simple helper function to find a specific node within the abstract syntax tree. And here what we're gonna do is we're gonna find all of our class declarations that start with message. Okay, very simple rule. So again, the interface could be messy, but we want to do, but, you, but the nice thing about here is you can write the, the rule to find specific AST nodes in Python, right? And here, it's very simple again, but you, know, you can make it more complex depending on looking at different kind of parameters about the data. Again, uh, just a helper function for displaying the, the node. And here's our sample message A. And here's the, the uh, AST node. One thing to note is, you know, then you have a bunch of information, anything you possibly need about this specific class. Again, it has children, so it has more code within it, right? One thing to note is the ispod flag. So PODs are plain old data, so this is your ints, your floats. A class is not a POD because it has fields within it. So a float, our float B is a pod, right? Uh, but again, it's private, so we can't really, you know, it, this is only the compiler that can see this. So then we look at, the function get b, and one thing to note is we also know the result type and whether the result type is um, a POD, right? So that's going to help us to generate our schema, and I'm going to show you what that actually means in a moment, right? And here, again, we have our uh, nested class. Again, it's not a pod because it is another class, right? So, so we have this information. Again, the POD, essentially, that's our column. That's, that's how we want to break down our C++ um, automatically, so this way we can, then we could save it as a column inside of our final final data. Okay, so, so this function actually generates the schema. So we're not actually gonna break down the classes. What we're gonna do is we're gonna generate the schema, and then we're gonna use that schema to actually create our converter. Okay, so one thing we do is here, what we do is for every of our messages, for every class we're interested in, we're gonna look for our C++ method. That starts with get, very simple. You can make this more complex. You do have the full AST, so you could actually look at it more and figure out you know, better ways of kind of looking at the interface. Here is uh, the display function for actually getting the getter. And here are the two functions. So the first one, we just check if it's a POD. So the second one, it does two things. First, it, it unwinds type def. So we have a type def, right? What it'll do, it'll actually go to whatever, whatever the actual underlying type is and keep breaking it down. But also what it will do is, for any complex class it finds, it will actually try to generate a schema for it. So what does it actually mean? So here we have our message A. Notice we have our get A, get B, with the float and we, we know exactly how to generate the code for this. We have the message B. And we also picked up the prices, the nested class. That was actually, the, the class was in a separate header file, but we still picked it up, right? Um, just because it was there and our code was, hey, hey, I see class, it still has data, and I still want to, you know, continue breaking it down and so, so this way we can access it, right? Um, so then what we're going to do is, again, you know, there's a lot of code here, just, I'm gonna post all these slides to, to my GitHub. So again, we just use a Jinja template to generate the converter. Let me just make some points about the converter. So again, this is the kind of um, converter you would have to create. So there's two functions, unfortunately, you have to write C++ for, right? So you have to write for your PODs the actual conversion, right? So what you do is for your float and your int, you will actually have to create the schema. So this is a float 32 in, uh, in uh, Apache Arrow. Uh, then you actually have to push the data into the column. Same thing for the ints, you're gonna have to push the data into the column. So again, whatever POD types you have, you will have to provide these functions, however you wanna do, right? And then here we have the generated code, right? So we have our convert for message A, we have the two columns. So again, we extracted just A and B, and that's, what, that's the way we're gonna name our columns, right? Because it was, it was called get A. Again, you could have more, you know, kind of more advanced logic to do that. We have our message B, prices and price. Here's the Jinja template that we use to generate it and our prices. So again, prices gets treated just like a message because it is another class. And because of upper, you know, C++ knows how to kind of resolve overloads and that's how it's gonna keep breaking it down. Again, so this is, you know, our getters. Here again, it was, it was our getters. And here we use the display name and name to actually generate this code. The nice thing about this is it'll scale, right? It, does, it doesn't care if there's a thousand messages, it doesn't care if there's, there's a thousand getters. It'll just create the code for you every time, right? And here's two more functions you have to implement. One is to create the table, and one to actually write the table to parquet. 
Um, one thing about Parquet, it is strongly typed. So we have messages with different types. They're going to have a different schema, right? So one way of doing it, which I'm going to show, is to essentially have a file, Parquet file per message type. So, and again, um, this is what this code does. So we have two converters, message A and message B. And here's, here's the sample code to drive this, right? So we have a main function. It goes, um, you know, generates some data. And here are the two, two Parquet files. So, so one thing about Parquet, it has extra metadata and schema already inside the file. So here, again, here's the metadata. We have some information about it, the row groups, how many rows, how many columns, the size, uh, by who was created. Um, you also have the schema, right? So right away, you know what the type and the column names are, right? Um, so the nice thing is, right, we took our C++ code and we put a schema on top of it, right? Because technically, a, you know, a class in C++ does have an implied schema. It just, it's not exposed, right? Um, and this actually exposes it uh, externally. And finally, this is kind of what the data would look like using this code, right? Um, nice, nice and compact. The nice thing about this code is you could put it inside a CI system and actually not check in the code that gets generated. So this way, you'll always pick up changes. Um, so this way, you know, it's always up to date. It always sees the code. As long as the original code worked and your Jinja templates are fine, the code should, should always, you know, get generated the right way, get built, and be always up to date. So, so hope, hopefully there's a couple few bits you guys could pick up that are helpful. Um, thank you very much. You, you, I'll post the, uh, the code to my GitHub. It's not up there yet. I'll do it after the presentation. This is what I used to actually generate all the numbers, and, um, and you know, that's my hardware. And uh, now we could ask some questions if you guys want. We have plenty of time. Mm -hmm. So, so the question was, should we start with Arrow instead of Pandas? Yes, I think so. And I think, so if you, there's a blog post that Wes posted about Pandas 2.0. I, you know, I'm not really familiar where that's going, but I know, you know, he, he is invested in Apache Arrow 2. There are some, um, there's a project called Gandiva. There's another uh, kind of like a data frame framework in Pandas. I can't remember the type uh, off the top of my head right now. I think it's VAX, something like that, which actually uses Apache Arrow underneath, right? So, so again, um, so, so yes, so, so, so one thing that I've showed you, right, if you actually just, instead of reading like your CSV file or your JSON, if you use Apache Arrow, you automatically, it's gonna be tremendous speed it uh, increases, right? Um, and then you actually, you know, it doesn't support a lot of things. It does convert easily into pandas. But you could, you know, if you don't actually, if you just wanna convert some data from something, it's much better just to use it in Apache Arrow, right? And you always have the ability to convert it to a pandas data frame after, right? So. Yes? Exactly. Yes, exactly. So it doesn't have the analytics, um, any of that in the analytics at this point, right? But it, it is a better way to represent, you know, uh, yeah, the way, like NumPy, I think it really, you know, people looked at NumPy and they say, hey, let's make it better. So this way it actually works across everything, right? So this is a Apache technology, right? So what it is, it works with like Hadoop and Spark and things like that. That's the kind of the point where you would, create your data once and you could move it around these systems without actually have to deserialize and reserialize the data and like encode it. It would be just the way it is actually laid out in memory. So. Java yes, all sorts of, yeah. Every single language, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have a list, but yes, you, all the major languages. And again, it is, you know, it is Parquet. It's very tightly, uh, you know, tied to Parquet. Parquet is the, you know, de facto standard in you no know, big data, so. Exactly. Yes, so, so, so the way you do it is, so you would have to essentially use shared memory. It's called, do you have a, um, you know, you could do it yourself. What they do is you could do it over Kafka. However, what they do is it's called Plasma. So it's, it's part, of, part of the project where you would actually do it over shared memory. So you would actually put your arrow table directly into shared memory and something else could just atta attach to the shared memory and just read it directly. You wouldn't have to actually change the data, right? Um, so, you know, you, yeah, you wouldn't be able to kind of move it around between 
uh, you know, that's the only way. You have to do some sort of IPC between two kind of, you know, like Java and C++ because they're, you know, separate processes. But on the shared memory side, what's it's in shared memory, you wouldn't have to change it at all. You know, because it's, it's like a specification of how to lay out memory so this way any, any system can read it. Any other questions? I, I don't know, honestly. Uh, I, 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 we, we, we use it, uh, you know, I use it for analysis. It's, it seems very stable. We're actually going to have some projects that will go into production with this. Um, you know, uh, I feel it's, it's, I see, I see. I mean, we could talk, yeah. So. <laughs> I use it, it helped out because again, I don't know, you know, in Bloomberg we have a lot of this code which is only in C++, right, and then just, and, you know, you have to look at a lot of differences. You have to figure out anything, and it's just so much easier just to do it. Convert it, you know, that takes time, unfortunately, but it's still better to actually have, you know, you could just do it in Panda. It's a much, much better way of, than doing anything else, you know. And, yes, people actually do that. The awk example, I've seen, you know, where I work, people do, that's the first thing to jump on, so, you know. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. But you, one thing you can do... Um, I, I'm not sure if it can read from like HDFS because it is not. It's not. It's not. A, it's not SQL, right? So like, if, as long as it's bits, I know. I know one thing you can do on the C++ side. You can. There's a, like a like a file stream, right? So you can actually save it, let's say, into like a Kafka uh, message and then like broadcast uh, broadcast that, right? So 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 the SQL side that would be something on top of Apache Arrow that would actually look into the data, you know. So so it doesn't support that at the moment, but. Yes, and it, you know, it doesn't support, it doesn't flatten lists, which is unfortunate, um, but, you know. And yes, yeah, so you could actually read a JSON with like nested structures into an Apache Arrow table. And if there's no list, you could actually just keep saying flatten, 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 it'll just flatten everything. That's pretty convenient if you have something that kind of data, so. Questions, comments? All right, well, thank you guys. So again.